So uh, today, uh, I'm going to show you uh, three major things you can improve. Well, two major things you can improve about images and one that is just cool. I'm going to show you how JPEG works. And you might not believe it, but JPEG does not store pixels. Like, there's not a single pixel in the file. There are uh, frequency coefficients. And I'll sh it sounds mysterious, but I'll show you how. Uh, then uh, I'll show you how to make the best use of uh, progressive rendering of images. Uh, it's an old feature supported by uh, JPEG, uh, but recently uh, it was, it's became possible to do it even better. And finally, I'll show you um, possibilities for future uh, formats and how can you uh, squeeze maximum compression available today in browsers. Uh, so let's start. Uh, everything that JPEG does is based around your eyes. And your eyes are imperfect, very imperfect. So here's an example image. Uh, and what I'm going to do, I'm going to blur it. I've heavily blurred the image, and you can still see it's the same image. I know people in the back are probably correcting their glasses like, is that a trick question? Like, nothing changed. <laughs> But technically, uh, this blurring removed a lot of information from the file. Uh, in a more mathematical terms, it's equivalent to a low-pass filter if you interpret uh, this image as a set of frequencies. Uh, so let's look at what I've removed from the image. Your own eyes will tell you uh, that this part on the left, that's actually the image still. That's the important content. And that part on the right, it's like some edges, some noise, uh, but it doesn't seem to be important uh, that much. It barely, you can barely see anything. However, if you've asked a robot or something else that had to encode what's on the screen, uh, it would tell you that this is 2% of all the information on the screen, and this is 98% of information on the screen. Uh, technically, mathematically, edges and details and noise are the hardest, the most expensive thing to represent digitally, to represent as information. But for our, our eyes, which are kind of imperfect, uh, this, is, it, this is not important. Our eyes pay attention more to the lower frequencies. And this trick is exactly what JPEG is based around. It's like, if we, have, if we remove 90% uh, of information from the image, it still looks like the image. So why not do that? Uh, to actually perform that trick, what JPEG does, it divides the image into blocks. Because it happens that when you have a block of 64 pixels, uh, those 64 pixels can form uh, only 64 different frequencies. Um, it's similar to analyzing audio, like in the, any piece of sound. You can have a bass sounds and treble sounds and then everything in between, uh, and you can analyze it as a different set of frequencies. JPEG does it the same, and if you graphically look at how it, how it uh, looks like, uh, it's sort of like layers. Layers with different patterns. Lower frequencies create gradient-like patterns. Higher frequencies create uh, different line patterns, dots, and so on. And uh, uh, these patterns combine like as if you've used uh, additive blending in Photoshop. It's like all of those are per each square. It's not a mosaic. It's everyone, every single layer on top of any, and every single layer. And they can cleverly combine to give you any combination, any pattern, in that block. It's, I know it's very hard to imagine, uh, but it's just math. It checks out. That's, that's the brilliance behind the discrete cosine transform uh, in, J in JPEG. Uh, so um, when you analyze a little bit of image, not all of those frequencies are pre present uh, in every uh, part of the image. Most of them aren't. So that's already a huge saving, because uh, we've analyzed 64 uh, pixels, but ended up with, say, uh, 20 different uh, possible frequencies that happen in that block. So we've removed, changed 64 bytes into 20 already. 
Uh, and then there's another thing. Uh, because your eyes are not equally sensitive to all those patterns, uh, when you s change quality of a JPEG, what you're actually telling uh, the encoder is to use fewer of those frequencies, remove those least important ones uh, that don't contribute much to uh, any given block. Uh, and it will still, most of the time, form uh, some kind of a pattern that looks like the original image. Uh, and that, but when you get the quality way too low, you're not leaving uh, the encoder many possible patterns to work with. And that's when the JPEG becomes obviously blocky, uh, breaks down, and you can see uh, the trick behind this. So properly encoded JPEG, if you uh, give it enough room to work with, um, does not exhibit that uh, blockiness, but still uh, is able to uh, remove a lot of the data. Uh, from the image. And because it's not removing individual pixels, it's removing this other abstract representation, um, it still serves all of the pixels of the image without losing resolution. Uh, once we figure out the minimum set of data we want in the JPEG file, uh, what we're going to do uh, is uh, put it in a file. And typically, a file in a JPEG is put uh, as a baseline JPEG from uh, top to bottom, all of the frequencies, the low resolution ones, the, the like background color-like frequencies, and also the high resolution ones, the ones representing uh, fine edges uh, and fine textures, are put for every block uh, from top to bottom. So when the image loads, it loads exactly from top to bottom. But what if we rearrange this data? What if we put the low frequencies first, and the less important, the details, last in the file. We're not adding any extra information. It doesn't cost any more data on the wire. Uh, but we're, we're making the image load now, instead of top to bottom, load full image, starting from blurry, uh, without detail, to sharp, uh, with a lot of detail. And it's not like a trick where you have some kind of a placeholder on your web page where you first load one image and then swap it for another. Uh, that costs you extra requests, that costs you extra data, wasted on the thumbnail that is going to be thrown away. It's the same data uh, in the same file, just rearranged to load uh, in a more sensible order. Uh, and in case of JPEG uh, specifically, it actually even improves the compression a little bit, because compression likes to have similar data grouped together. And if you group similar levels of detail in the file together, uh, that compresses better. So let's see how that looks like. Uh, here's an enlarged uh, example to just make it super obvious how the blockiness looks like. Uh, and this is an image. Uh, here with just 15% of the file downloaded. It's very blocky, but if you actually use it on a page on a regular resolution or even a retina resolution, uh, the blocks are not even that bad. But it, this is just a 10% or 15% of the file. If we go uh, just to 25% of the file, it starts looking like the actual image. 25% of the file. And you can already see uh, the content of the image. Of course, it's somewhat blocky, so a little bit low quality. Uh, if we go to the half of the file, uh, we reduce some blockiness. Uh, and only when you go to 100% of the file, you will notice that the color changed a little bit. Uh, maybe it became a little sharper, but there's barely any difference. Like, already at 25% of the image, uh, we've seen it look really well. For user experience, uh, if, if you apply this to your entire page, that seems like a huge win, right? You need only a quarter or so of your bandwidth to fool uh, users temporarily into thinking that the image has finished loading. That's, that's better than you can get with any other compression level. That's better if you just uh, lower the quality of your image 
it sort of makes the quality even less important because the quality adjusts itself to amount of data uh, downloaded. So if it's so cool, um, why isn't everyone using it? Why is it? Why is it not making difference on actual website? Actual websites. The problem is on actual websites you have more than one image. Let's say we have a image heavy website and we still use progressive images, but the problem is the browser uh, will request uh, images one after another. The server will send them in full one after another. So even though each image individually loads progressively, um, and it's probably even hard to see that you load progressively uh, on the on the projector because um, this is actual scale and the blocks uh, are much smaller. So uh, still images appear to download top to bottom on the page, even though uh, individual image might be loaded progressively. And that's not the fault of the format. That's not the fault of the image. That's entirely problem of how the network works. Simply, if you ask the server to send you an image, it will just send you the whole image. And while th this one image is downloading, uh, the connection is busy and cannot download anything else. So even with progressive images, loading progressively properly individually, we still end up with a page that is half empty. But what if we could fix this? Um, and here is, boom, all of the images loaded progressively at the same time. This is the first progressive layer. Uh, if you look closely, uh, some of those images are still very blocky. It's still 15% of the data. Uh, if we go to 20% of the data, they already look like the whole page is loaded. But it's like 20% of the first image, 20% of the second image, 20% of the third image, rather than 20% of images on the page. So this parallelization is a key. Oh, and you've probably noticed, like, the one, of, one of them looks, looks broken. Uh, this one is WebP. Uh, WebP does not support progressive rendering at all. Like, the wins that WebP got in compression to be somewhat like 20 or 30% smaller than JPEG for uh, comparable quality uh, made it impossible to render progressively. So let's look like so let's look how it looks like uh, when we download the rest of the image, and the JPEGs are still loading. Even though WebP looks looked like the it finished last, the WebP on the screen finished first, and the JPEGs were loading for a couple of seconds more. But the JPEGs were progressive, so they were loading tiny details, um, those uh, precise colors, uh, small edges, that you want to have an image in case. Uh, you want to still have those details in the image in case the user looks closely. But during page load, uh, your users won't even have time to look at it. So the illusion for progressive uh, works very well. Uh, and formats that improve compression but don't support progressive are like one step forward but two steps back. With JPEG, you can serve nice user experience with uh, half of the data and just load the rest of the details later rather than have a half empty image. It's not like the optimist pessimist thing where is the image half empty or half full. With progressive image, the image is full all the time. Uh, so how did how did I do this trick? How did I force all of the images uh, to nicely download in parallel all of them at the same time? Uh, and the answer, the key for to this is HTTP2. Uh, you've seen yesterday HTTP2. Uh, to improve the head of line blocking problem uh, supports multiplexing. So uh, while it can just send the whole file from the server in one go as one huge piece, it has the capability to split the file into s smaller chunks and send the chunks in any order mixed with other files in, the, in between. It doesn't cost any uh, extra requests. It's like it still responds, but instead of server responding, here's the whole file, the server says, um, here's a bit, and please wait for the rest. In the meantime, uh, get this other file, and maybe check out the other file, uh, bit by bit. 
And when we combine it with progressive JPEGs, this is exactly what we, what we want, because the server can send, um, here's a bit of first image, and second, and third, and fifth. Uh, and you learn, the browser immediately learns about all the images on the page, uh, learns dimensions of the, all of the images, so we can start doing the full layout of all images on the page early, uh, without waiting for rest of the data of the images. Uh, the difficulty there is, uh, web servers, typical web servers like Nginx, Apache, or so, so, although they can do that, they just don't expose it as a feature. Like there's no config option that you enable to make like, progressive images render like they should. Um, so when we cannot do something natively, what do we do? We hack it with JavaScript. Um, there are two ways. Um, <clears throat> to implement this yourself in JavaScript, and I mean server-side JavaScript. Um, it's not, not the browser thing, like on the browser side you cannot really do much with it, because it's about how the data is sent, and on the receiving end you just don't have enough control. So server-side, we can do it in Node.js. Uh, the nice thing about Node.js requests is there are streams, and streams are made of chunks, and you have full control of uh, how large each chunk is and where you're going to send it. Um, even if your uh, Node.js server sits behind uh, Nginx a proxy, uh, the trick will still work most of the time uh, because the chunks sent uh, from your uh, Node.js stream uh, translate almost exactly into HTTP2 frames, this multiplexed uh, stream that we want. Uh, so I'm not going to present you actual full code for, for doing this, uh, simply because it doesn't nicely fit on a slide. I don't want you to read the like, little, tiny little text and try to copy it. But I'm going to describe you the rough algorithm, uh, which is like that. Uh, your node server has to receive the request, so you have to set it up to serve static files as well. Usually you have some kind of a middleware or a route in your Nginx to serve st static files in a classic way, uh, but here the key point is we want to uh, do the uh, request handling even for images in our node server ourselves. Uh, when request comes, uh, you get it from the disk, and you immediately respond with something like first kilobyte or first half kilobyte. Uh, this is because this is the header of the image, the metadata, that contain image size, and as soon as you send the image size with just this little information which costs almost nothing, uh, the browser uh, will know the image size and will be able to do layout in case you forgot to put width height uh, in your uh, markup, which happens all the time. <clears throat> so this frees the browser to start uh, crunching your CSS uh, with the knowledge of images without the heavy bandwidth of images uh, blocking everything else. And here's the weird one. Now you wait. And it's like, you make your website faster by making responses slower? Uh, it does make sense, uh, because images are not the only thing uh, that is happening on the page. That's one reason. Uh, if we wait a little bit, we give the browser a moment to process CSS, uh, JavaScript, and altogether more critical resources. There's no point sending images if the browser hasn't parsed CSS yet, because it will not display them anyway. Um, another reason is, even though browser sort of tries to send all the image requests at the same time, they're not actually sent at the same time. Physically, they have to be on the connection, sent one after another, and it takes a few milliseconds to for all of this to be sent and processed. And on the server, we want to see all of those requests at the same time, so we can coordinate across all the requests coming from uh, each user. So um, once we've waited that little bit, we can start sending the progressive actual bytes of the image. Um, it might seem difficult, because how do you know where the progressive layer is in the file, how much you send it? 80% of the time, uh, it's good enough if you just send the first 15% of the file. Uh, JPEGs, surprisingly, tend to compress very similarly uh, in terms of how the progressive layers are laid out in the file. 
So if you just chop the 15% of the bytes of the uh, image and send it back to the browser, uh, it will give the desired effect. And here's the difficult bit uh, that requires a little bit of bookkeeping, that requires uh, working with perhaps JavaScript promises. Uh, if, if that sounds scary, uh, I gave a talk about advanced use of JavaScript promises, so Google that. <laughs> uh, and you wait for all of the requests across all of the image requests that your node server is currently handling. This is because you want to ensure uh, that the server uh, has sent um, all the first layers. So the browser starts rendering all the first layers because before uh, the connection is uh, overwhelmed by the heavy uh, rest of the files. Uh, and it works great. Um, I have proof. I have receipts. Uh, if you don't know webpagetest.org, uh, you have my war warm welcome to your first ever performance conference. Um, let's look uh, at the visual completion of the page uh, with just regular uh, embedded uh, J JPEGs. They're progressive, but they're served from a vanilla uh, web server. Uh, and the progress is linear. Uh, they sort of load, but uh, it, still, it still looks mostly like image after image. So visual completion of the page over time uh, gradually grows. But when we do the trick where we push, well, when we send first layer progressive first, look at this hump. Like, uh, as soon as the browser starts receiving the, those first bits of uh, images, uh, the page Im very quickly becomes almost complete. That's the, that's the huge win in the user experience uh, because you're, you're jumping to 75% complete uh, page right at the beginning of the loading, rather at the end of the loading, and there is no data wasted. It's just how the order in which we send the data, and it's fully compatible on the wire. It's, those are same protocols. We're just using them better. It is a protocol violation, technically. Uh, images like our OC layer 7, um, and we're adding OC layer 8 JavaScript uh, and manipulating things on the uh, transport layer. But it gives a huge win. Uh, doing this with Node, however, has one big problem. Uh, you've already heard the bad news about the speed of light. Um, and uh, I'm using a single Node server uh, for my personal website. That's my architecture. Uh, instead of having data centers all around the world, I just have one Node server uh, that serves everyone. Uh, and that's okay if you're running your personal website, but the chances are, uh, if you're responsible for some global high traffic website, they will tell you, you have to have your, all your static files, including images, cached on a CDN so that it's served all around the world with low latency. And this, unfortunately, completely ruins the trick. Because even if on your side you implement this very careful chopping of files, you beautifully deliver uh, the image to the CDN, uh, CDN will just save it to disk and then serve it from disk like a rock. <laughs> just <laughs> throw the whole file at a user, uh, completely forgetting all the effort you've put uh, to serve those files in the bit and bits and coordinate it uh, across connections and so on. Uh, and until recently, that seems like a lost cause. Uh, CDNs don't support this chopping themselves, uh, and you want to use CDN. Um, but uh, there's one that has a thing called Edge Workers. Um, it's exactly like Service Worker, but completely different. <laughs> uh, because it doesn't run in the browser, uh, it runs sort of server side, but not on your server on the server of the CDN. So edge workers are like real-time filter for all of the data that comes out of the CDN to the browser. Uh, so edge workers run exactly where we want them. Um, although service workers 
uh, in the browser are really cool and can do a lot of things. Uh, for this progressive trick, they cannot do anything because um, service worker will just receive the whole file uh, from the CDN and one chopping it further and serving it in any more clever way. Um, it, at this point, it's too late. You're not controlling what's on the wire. But with Edge Worker, you do. And Edge Worker is just JavaScript, is using JavaScript streams, which have chunks, which you control. Um, and that's uh, the regular JavaScript stand standard W3C uh, streams API. Uh, instead, of, instead of fetching, res uh, fetching requests and just returning it as a response from your uh, Edge Worker, uh, you insert a transform stream in between, and you read the response body, uh, and you write to that transform stream uh, you've just created. And if you just do a naive loop like this, uh, read a bit of data, send a bit of data, wait until it's sent, read another bit of data, um, that's like no operation, you're just sending data further. So in, we insert um, hacks in that loop. Uh, every bit of data is a, a JavaScript typed array, which you can uh, chop into pieces, into subarrays. So here, for example, I'm sending first 500 bytes of a chunk. Uh, then I'm waiting, uh, which uh, lets this, this little wait uh, gives time other requests to jump in and send whatever they want to send. And then uh, I'm sending the rest of the chunk. This is not the full logic. Uh, like I've mentioned, the housekeeping for uh, handling all the connections and waiting across uh, all the connections to the same IP address, uh, that, that's an exercise for you uh, to implement. But it does work. It does work, and you can implement that technique uh, worldwide, on your CDN, on top of all your cached JPEGs already distributed globally. And you've seen visually, uh, it changes image-heavy website from image-heavy website to whoop, the whole thing loaded in just 15 or 20% of the data. How you do it? Um, most JPEG uh, is the best uh, JPEG compressor for this use case that you can find already. Uh, it's specifically for compressing uh, images for the web. Uh, it supports progressive rendering out of the box for every image. Uh, and it even fine-tunes all of these progressive layers for the best compression. So it gives uh, smaller JPEGs than you would get from, say, for web, uh, and it always gives you progressive, and it's compatible with all the browsers. Uh, so you don't have to worry about anything else. You just use this one. Technically, most JPEG is a library, so proper usage would be uh, take your favorite image manipulation tool. It could be image magic, GIMP, or whatever you can get your hands on, and compile it, replacing standard libjpeg library from 1998 uh, with this new one. Uh, in practice, nobody likes to compile things, so there's also a command line tool and known modules and uh, other utilities, like ImageOptim, uh, that will uh, run uh, most JPEG for you. In case of image optim, uh, that's my work. Uh, you could drag and drop your images into the window and they're gonna be, oh, uh, and you enable lossy conversion uh, in the preferences. And you're gonna get uh, right quality, right format uh, at the best compression uh, that you can get. So uh, now, this is for serving progressive, progressive compressed well. What if you want to compress more? Uh, it's like JPEG has been around for a long while. And isn't there anything better? And when we look at what happened, it's like with image formats, there's like nothing interesting happening for a long time. Uh, but if video formats have been advancing uh, all the time. So uh, thankfully, uh, Google, uh, bought and released uh, in the open a VP8 codec. Uh, VP8 was developed much earlier than the Google released it. Uh, it was like a private uh, commercial software. Uh, 
And VP8 was a response to H.264, which is currently still the most popular video format used on the web. So we kind of have like 2006 codec that's the same class as 2003 codec. Uh, so obviously, uh, the progress moves on, and uh, we can do better. But in the meantime, when uh, VP8 was uh, publicly released for free for everyone, Google thought, like, if everyone is going to be using VP8 videos everywhere on the web, why not get a like image format for free? And WebP uh, was created. WebP is sort of a trick, or a hack. It's WebM uh, video based on VP8 codec, except it's just one frame of the video. Like, like very, very short video clip, and let's call it an image. Uh, it's a neat trick, because if you support the video codec, you get the image format for free. But the world kind of moved on, and VP9 was released. Uh, and YouTube now mainly uses VP9. Uh, Netflix uses VP9. Um, and VP8 got forgotten, like got obsoleted. Uh, but VP8 still lives in WebP. WebP was not upgraded because upgrading uh, video for uh, upgrading image formats is so much harder uh, than upgrading video formats, uh, simply because they're used in so many more places so much more often. Uh, and the development of VP codecs continued. Uh, there was a VP10, uh, but it never got released um, because even better codecs uh, came around. Mozilla was working on a DALA project. Cisco was working on a Thor encoding project. Uh, and uh, fortunately, they have all got together and thought, instead of releasing three or four competing codecs, let's cooperate. Let's get best ideas of every uh, individual codec together. Uh, and they formed Alliance of Open Media and released format called AV1. AV1 uh, has a compression similar to H.265 codec. Uh, but, but it's free. H.265 codec is not free. In fact, it has uh, such a problematic licensing uh, situation that uh, it pushed all the big players to support AV1 instead. And even Apple is on board with AV1. Apple currently uses and pays, and you pay when you buy your iPhone for license to use H H265. And all the photos you take on the latest iOS are actually compressed as H.265, not as JPEG anymore. Um, that's because uh, both H.265 and AV1 compress twice as good as WebP. It's half size of WebP, and less than half size of a JPEG. Uh, they compress so well uh, that uh, it makes sense for, for Apple to uh, double amount of photos you can store uh, on your iPhone. Uh, oddly, you're, you're paying less premium for, for Apple storage. <laughs> um, but the format H.265 is not used on the web. It's not exposed to the web yet. Uh, but AV1 is. Uh, AV1 shipped in Chrome 70. Uh, AV1 is built into Firefox behind the flag, and uh, it's going to be ready to ship soon. Um, Apple is on board in the Alliance of Open Media organization, so we guess they'll release it somehow. You know, Apple doesn't say what they're going to do, uh, but you know, hoping, hoping there. Uh, it's already in Chrome, so uh, and Chrome-based browsers, uh, so Opera, Brave, UC Browser, and so on. It's uh, built into FFmpeg4, uh, so chances are you can actually start using AV1. Um, but wait, wait a minute, we're talking about images, not videos. So the thing is, um, if you want to get the best compression today, uh, you do an awful hack and put your images in a video tag. <laughs> uh, that's how you do it. This gives you access to the latest and greatest codec. And uh, Browsers have been uh, reluctant to ship WebP. So it's, WebP is still supported uh, only in Chrome-based browsers. Uh, because it is an improvement, but it's not much of an improvement. Uh, it doesn't support progressive. The compression is, depending on how you look at it, some say 15%, some say, some say 30%. It's not 10x, definitely. Um, 
So it's not a, it's not a, has been a, a huge improvement to seem like it's worth switching the entire web to a new format. Um, but the improvements in AV1 uh, are uh, compression that is twice as good, definitely. Uh, no doubt about it. Uh, that's, a, that's a good motivator. Uh, there's a spec for uh, image format based on AV1. Uh, the spec is kind of funny because um, when Apple used H.264 compression uh, in iOS, they've adopted a, a quirky, uh, not very well-known uh, format before uh, called uh, HAIF. Uh, and the spec for uh, AV1 uh, image format says, do exactly what Apple did, but instead of using the paid codec, use the free one. It's like, if you read the spec, it's basically paraphrasing the thing. Uh, so the new image format uh, uh, called AVIC uh, uh, supports all the features that iOS camera supports. So it has image bursts, uh, it has live, uh, uh, live photos. Um, not very interesting for web, but uh, it's possible that eventually it will be the one format to rule them all. But in the meantime, we do the video hack. Uh, and to get uh, your uh, single frame of video encoded with something like FFmpeg, uh, tune the, the uh, video bandwidth to whatever size of the image you think uh, should, should be uh, and it looks good, uh, and then embed it. Uh, make sure to say it's muted and auto play and plays in line to avoid video-like things happening with it, like popping to a full screen when, when it's tapped. Uh, you don't want that uh, if you want to pretend it's an image. Um, <clears throat> and, um, and you, would, <laughs> uh, you would think that if you have your website design that has this huge hero image, now everyone who sells to enterprise must have some kind of a smiling person from a stock photo. Uh, in a hipster office for like 80% of the viewport. Uh, and you would think, oh, that's an expensive. If, if we make it a video, oh, it's even more expensive. Uh, but it's not. Uh, you, you might even make it like cinema graph kind of thing. Just don't make it a full ad. Uh, but if you make a still image or image with a slight movement, the, as a video, the video will be smaller, much, much smaller, much more bandwidth efficient uh, than if you just use the static image. That's the worst situation we live in. Um, and that's, uh, that's my talk for today. So to recap, uh, for now, progressive images improve UX a lot. Uh, if you do the uh, server-side trick with uh, chopping them into bits on HTTP2 connection, uh, that's wow effect. And you can use most JPEG to create those images. Uh, while we're still using JPEGs, uh, that's the best encoder for images for the web. Um, and we're eagerly waiting AV1. It's, it's coming. It's already sort of already there for videos. Uh, and uh, you, know, you, you can be sure I'll be w working on more encoders, tools, uh, and releasing the stuff that I've been uh, showing as some kind of a library that you can uh, plug into your infrastructure. Uh, so uh, watch at stuff that I'm doing. I'm mostly releasing this on my GitHub, so you can follow me there. Thank you. That was great, Cornell. I wanted to tweet. I've heard you know, heard you t speak before, and when you start talk, like I kind of, I have never worked too much on image optimization, and when I hear you start talking about it, when I hear people talk about it, I get nervous that it's going to go over my head. But when I hear you talk about it, I feel like I'm I'm in a warm, comfy place, and you're going to explain it that. to me in a way I can digest. And you did that today. I appreciate it. Um, so, I don't know if I missed this at the beginning. We had to step out and do a little bookkeeping thing. Uh, what kind, do you have a dog? And if so, what kind? I don't, so if someone wants to rent me a dog, I'm, <laughs> I'm happy. Uh, <laughs> yeah, that would be great. Did anyone, I, don't, I haven't seen a yeah, dog anyone here. Anyone has a dog? Yeah. <laughs> I thought someone was getting up and bringing us a dog. Um, let's see, so, uh, the technique you explained about uh, 
downloading some of the uh, image and then having a delay. How could someone implement that? Could someone use that technique if they have a CDN? Probably not. Um, so if you're using Cloudflare CDN with Edge Workers, you can do this yourself in JavaScript. Uh, if you're a person working on a CDN for like us for the company, uh, yeah, you should start pinging your project managers. You should implement this for everyone automatically because it's like, it's like no brainer. It's no extra overhead on the wire and it makes websites look so much better. And so if that's a good suggestion for people who work at CDNs to do it automatically, is that going to be something that Cloudflare might start doing rather than having people have to build an edge worker to do it? Do you think Cloudflare will just start doing it automatically? Uh, it's something that I would like to implement. <laughs> oh. um, how about if it's a good thing to do automatically by default in CDNs, how come browsers don't do it? Should that, is browsers that something don't have that level of control. Uh, the chunking oh, is yeah. selected by the server, not That's by right. the browser. Yeah. Uh, Chrome tries to do that by making range requests. There's a lazy loading uh, experimental feature. Uh, but if the browser does it with range requests, obviously it costs you extra requests uh, to get partial data. No. And I just wanted to, uh, I didn't want to contradict you at all, especially in this area. But I think you huh? said WebP is only supported by Chrome-based browsers. I thought I just saw Firefox and Edge rolling out support for WebP, no? Uh, they are on the edge of releasing it. it it's a standoff. Uh, nobody wants to look worse than Chrome. Uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, but on the other hand, they're not very keen on supporting it. So uh, if majority starts supporting it, then everyone will follow. So it's not uh, out in stable versions of Firefox and Edge um, support for WebP? Or it is so far. I think it's still still experimental, uh, but it, it's it's getting there. So it's it's very likely that we'll get support for WebP in all the browsers about six months before it's obsolete. <laughs> okay, the the video hack. <laughs> Are there? There's got to be some cons to doing that. Oh, <laughs> what uh, are the cons? Uh, the cons. Uh, Browsers think, think you're very serious about playing over the video. So they're prepared for the full HD streaming. So internally, they'll launch some threads. Uh, they might allocate more memory uh, for the full video codec than if it was an image. Uh, so there's, there's internal overhead. Um, and it's the complication for you because you have to use different markup. Do you know any big sites that have rolled out that hack and have any <laughs> case study results? Uh, currently, websites just go uh, all the way and just act, play actual video when they uh, think it's fine. Uh. And then I thought this, maybe this is the last question we'll do. I thought this was interesting. Uh, this came over Twitter from Julia. Uh, what's the fastest way to load images? Uh, an actual IMG tag? or a background image, and when should we use uh, the data base64 URL technique? Oh, the base64 is simple, never. Why? I thought that was good. <laughs> For not even small images? Um, it's an overhead, and uh, all the browsers uh, support, all the browsers that count support HTTP2. Uh, you can count on HTTP2 being there for all your important uh, users, and uh, it makes over overhead of a request small enough uh, that the all the complications of base64 and overhead uh, is just not worth it. Uh, instead, uh, in case of the images themselves, uh, it depends if you want to load the image or not to load the image. Uh, if you want to load the image and you want to load it fast, the image tag is absolutely fastest and best way to do it, and you cannot beat the browser at its own game. Uh, there are lots of uh, JavaScript libraries that will promise you to uh, preload images, uh, polyfill features, and so on. But the browsers have a preload scanner that identifies image requests, immediately queue it, immediately make requests with appropriate priority uh, before running even any single line of JavaScript. So if you mix images and JavaScript, you're starting from a losing position and you cannot catch up with what the browser is doing natively. 
Even worse, if you try to be clever and think, I'm going to run my JavaScript anyway and manipulate uh, image source, uh, the original request that was in the static HTML is already on the wire, so you'll end up downloading the image twice. So just keep JavaScript away from images uh, to load them quickly, except when you don't want them to load quickly, like lazy loading uh, of images below the fold or hidden somewhere, uh, then use whatever JavaScript hack you like. I think, I think there are also ways to get around it, but I believe that using the IMG ta tag is uh, better for accessibility reasons as well. Uh, of than course. Background Although images. it's not. Oh, the background image. Uh, it's not. This is accessible. This is. This is not. Uh, background images. It was on a uh, in a talk yesterday. Are just for decoration. Yeah. Uh, and uh, images in the content should be the content. Uh, the absolutely fantastic way to decide about it is imagine you're describing a, a page to someone on the phone. If you like, reach their image and said, and here's a nice dog, uh, put that in the alt tag. And uh, it also changes how you describe actual image. For example, you would say, here's a warning, rather than, here's a yellow triangle with an exclamation mark. So keep that in mind uh, in terms of accessibility. It was so good to see you today and hear this talk. It brought back good memories of Barcelona. Oh, yeah. Do you remember that? Yeah. All right. Thank you very much, Cornel. That's not our thing. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> thank you.